Thanks for joining us for this week's message from Family Church. Now, if this ministry has impacted your life in some way, we would love to hear your story. Just email your story to us at changedlife@familychurch.tv. Also, if you would like to become a financial supporter in doing ministry to keep broadcasts like this one coming to you every week, be sure to head to our website and click on the Give tab, and there you'll find the option that best fits you. Now, here's this week's message. We hope that it blesses you in some way. God is up to something today. And I'm excited to see what that's going to be all about. And I, I do want to get into the teaching in just a moment, but I, I want to share this first. Yesterday was a really busy day for me. I got up early, drove a long ways, had a book signing, and then after it was over, I spoke on how to break bad habits. And then I drove back home, and it was just a long day. And, and so it was time to go to bed. And, and normally at 9 o'clock, I go to bed, and within 30 seconds, I'm asleep. So I just go and go and go and go and go and go and go. And then, and then when it's time to go to bed, lights out. And last night, I could not go to sleep. And the Lord was dealing with me, and the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And the Holy Spirit said this. He said, the enemy operates through apathy. Apathy is indifference. It's the lack of passion. It's the lack of pursuit in your life. It's just static. Apathy is going through the motions without any emotions. It's just passionless and pursuitless. And there's a danger in that because when, when you stop pursuing right things, you start pursuing wrong things. And that, that's going to flow nicely with what we're going to talk about this morning. But as we move into this time together, I really want you to search your heart today. I want you to think about where you are in your relationship with God, not where you are that you still come to church, that you're still giving, that you're even still serving, but where you are in how much of your life is available for God to put his hands in and maybe move some things and change some things that would make you uncomfortable. So I want you to think about that this morning. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to John chapter 20, and we're going to read some verses from there in just a moment. Again, it's so good to see all of you here today, and it's nice to finally have some good weather for a change on Sunday. If you have your Bible, once again, you can turn to John chapter 20 and verse 30. I'm currently in a series that I'm calling Miraculous. And we're talking about what it looks like when God interrupts the regular, everyday life that you live with a demonstration of his power. And we're learning how to position ourselves if we want to experience a divine interruption. Now, I told you last week that a divine interruption is this. I want to read it one more time. A divine interruption is a window in time where God interrupts the daily routine of your regular life with a miracle that you may or may not have been expecting. It's God doing something in you and for you or around you that otherwise would have been impossible. It's something that happens in your life that maybe you were planning on or maybe you weren't planning on, but God was always planning on to take you into things that otherwise you could have never moved into or to give you things that you otherwise could have never received or to do something big in you that otherwise would have been impossible for you. Now, I don't know about you, but I want some divine interruptions in my life. I'm ready for some of those. I'm, I'm ready for some of those surprises uh, that, that only God can give. And last week we learned that divine interruptions happen in the now. And we learned that if you're stuck in a once upon a time, you will likely never experience the happily ever after that God has planned for you. And I know that many of you were here for that teaching and that's true. Now today I want to move on because I do have a lot of ground to cover. And I want to begin this morning with two verses of scripture from the book of John. 
John chapter 20 and verse 30 says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. What? How many of you honestly had missed that somehow? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So if you're like me, I'm thinking, what else did Jesus do? Was he the first to turn carrots into carrot cake? <laughs> because if you've ever had carrot cake, then you know that's a miracle. <laughs> How do they get it to taste so good? It has carrots in it. <laughs> I don't know why that was the first illustration that came to my mind when I'm thinking about what else did Jesus do? How many times did Jesus operate in the miraculous? Well, John answers that in the very next chapter, in John chapter 21 and verse 25. John 21 and verse 25 says, Jesus did many other things as well. Now look at this. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have enough room for the books that would be written. Isn't that awesome? The whole world wouldn't hold all the books. Our historical knowledge of how Jesus lived is very limited. And it's limited to what we record in the Gospels. But according to John, most of what Jesus did is not even written down. That's amazing to me. We know about the known things that Jesus did, but we don't know about a lot of the other things that Jesus did. Now, that, that, also, that also sheds new light on John 14, 12. Because in John 14, 12, this is Jesus talking here and he says, Verily, verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. <laughs> now remember, most of them we don't even know. And they will do even greater works than these. Because I'm going to my Father. I love that. We read that and we think, oh wow, that's exciting. What we don't realize is that we only have a thimble full of knowledge regarding the works that Jesus did. And yet Jesus said that we're not only going to do the things that Jesus did, we're going to do even greater things than Jesus did. Listen folks, no wonder the enemy works so ferociously to keep us from operating in the power that lives inside of us. No wonder he's trying to prevent us from walking in the power of God that lives inside of us. How much power lives inside of you, according to John, enough to fill every book ever written? Enough to fill every book ever written, and not just fill every book that is ever written, but to fill enough books that the whole earth could not even contain them. That's a lot of power living in you. That's a whole lot of power. Now, if this is true, and it is, what's, what's the disconnect? Why do we have mountains that won't move? Why do we have sleeping miracles that won't wake up? Why do we rebuke problems and addictions only to see them dig in deeper and stay put? How come life often dazes us instead of amazes us if all this is true? What's going on? Have we missed something? Do we not have the formula right? Has God changed his mind about the miraculous? Well, I say no, he hasn't. And so, this morning, let's explore the idea of moving mountains 
waking up sleeping miracles and multiplying what we lack until it becomes enough to give away. Does that sound good? Now, anytime, anytime that I prepare a teaching, obviously there's going to be spiritual application. But I always ask myself, what is the practical application? How does this, how does this play out in the life of a regular believer? So if I give you information from the scripture, I'm always thinking to myself, how does this play out in the life of a regular believer? How do we connect the dots of what God says he will do to actually seeing it in our lives? And, and by the way, not every teaching will be a home run for you. Some teachings will speak louder than others. And so I'm hoping today that this one connects with your heart. Because if you can get this, it will change everything. So what's the practical application of all of this? Well, let's look at two verses that I haven't been able to get out of my mind this week. One is found in Genesis 28. And the other is found in Judges 16. And let's talk about this disconnect. Remember... The scripture says that most of what Jesus did, we don't even have record of. That if what Jesus did, if it were written down, all the books in the world would not contain it. And yet, sometimes we look at our lives, and the pages of our lives are blank, or maybe not even blank, but all written with tragedy, or problems, or bad things. And so what's the disconnect? Genesis chapter 28 and verse 16 says this. It says, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. So in this story, the Lord was there, but Jacob didn't know it. Judges chapter 16 and verse 20. Then she called Samson, talking about Delilah. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So the Lord wasn't there, but Samson didn't know it. Samson had no idea that God was no longer with him. For all we know, he was still attending the family church campus in the Valley of Sorek, where Delilah lived. And this is really interesting to me, because in one case, the Lord was there, and in the other case, the Lord wasn't there, but in both cases, the men involved were completely oblivious. And that tells me something very important because I'm very familiar with both of these stories. And in both of these instances, neither Samson nor Jacob were obeying God in certain areas of their lives. They were no longer passionately pursuing God. They no longer cared about the things that God cared about. They were apathetic and stagnant and going through the motions. And here's why. You think about these two men, both incredibly powerful men for different reasons. You think about these two men. These stories that we read, they weren't making mistakes. Both of them were very much aware that what they were doing went against the heart of God, but they did it anyway. They did it anyway. What had they done? Jacob had just lied, he had just cheated. He had just stole his brother's birthright and his brother's blessing. 
Samson was involved in an immoral relationship with a woman named Delilah. Samson was completely infatuated with her to the point of giving away his calling and his anointing and his future. Yeah. And by the way, infatuation only lasts for about six months. And then all those little things that you love will drive you crazy. <laughs> and that's how you know you really love them. When all those little things don't make you leave them. If you were infatuated, you're gone. He wasn't in love with her. He thought he was. He was completely infatuated with her. And he was enjoying it. Both of these men struggled with disobedience. And here's how their stories ended. Genesis 28 and verse 20. Let's talk about Jacob first. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me, and he will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that you give me, I will give you back a tenth. Now, in Genesis chapter 47, we're not going to read it, but Jacob and his family go on and they settle in a place called Goshen. Now, Goshen means the place called best. Goshen was attached to Egypt. And so when the 10 plagues fell upon the land of Egypt, there was only one region where the plagues did not have any power. Guess where that was? It was in Goshen. Why? Because Jacob said, the Lord will be my God. And then he set up a pillar to represent the house of God, the community of God in his life. And then he started tithing to God. And so his story ended very well. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But let's look at Samson. Judges 16. It's interesting because, you know, Samson's life also ended with a pillar. Let's go ahead and read it. Judges 16 and verse 20, it says, Then she called Samson. Or, or, I'm sorry, let's go to Judges 16 and verse 21. It says this. It says, Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza. Listen, anytime you go against God, you're going down. Binding him with bronze shackles and they set him to grinding grain in the prison. Now later in that same chapter, Samson dies and most of you know the story. He finds the pillars of the temple and he pushes them out and the temple collapses on top of him and he's killed. And so, here's the moral of the story. One goes on to the place called Best and the other is imprisoned, blinded, and killed. And that tells me something. That tells me that the difference between experiencing the miraculous and experiencing misery over and over and over and over and over is really simple. Because the miraculous comes out of obedience to God, out of loyalty to his word, and out of a willingness in your life to correct your past mistakes. And that's what Jacob did. He was willing to correct his past mistakes. Do you know how you correct a past mistake? You stop making it. <laughs> Sometimes people will say to me, 
I just keep making the same mistake over and over and over and over. And I say to them, the first time it was a mistake. All the rest of these times, that's called an on purpose. What they should say is, I just keep deliberately doing all this dumb stuff and screwing up my life and going against God and not following the scripture and just kind of doing my own thing. And then when the bottom falls out, oh God. <laughs> you've, have you been there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. He's merciful. Because at some point you have to stop making on purposes. So with that in mind, let's, let's bring this back to Jesus because I think, you know, ultimately everything has to come back to Jesus, right? So let's bring this back to Jesus. In John chapter 2, we find the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. This story has always intrigued me and, and um, I want you to look with me at what Mary says right before the miracle. John chapter 2 and verse 5. John chapter 2 and verse 5 says, His mother said to the servants, Let's read it together. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. Why? Because that's where miracles happen. So I want to ask you a question. Do you do whatever he tells you? Well, it depends if I like it. <laughs> if I want to, I mean, if it lines up with where I see my five-year plan, do, we need wine for the party. They're out of wine. What should we do? Do whatever he tells you. And if you, if you read that story Jesus says, go get the water pots and fill them up with water and then draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. And, and you know, the water was turned into wine. And, but, but it all started with one, with one sentence. The miraculous started with one sentence. Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. See, guys, obedience moves mountains. Obedience moves wakes up sleeping miracles. Obedience multiplies what you lack until it becomes more than enough to give away. Isaiah 19 and, or Isaiah 1 and verse 19 says this. Look, look at this. It says, if you are willing and what? Obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. I, I got this perfect gift this morning I want to show you uh, from Scott and Renee Miller. And it really just perfectly illustrates what I'm talking about today. It says, live your life so the preacher doesn't have to lie at your funeral. <laughs> Don't make me lie about you. Don't make me get up and say, she loved God even when it was difficult. She followed the word even when everything around her said not to. She was a great example to her kids and to her family. She, she was a servant. Don't make me lie about you. I probably would. <laughs> Just because funerals are weird if you don't say good things. <laughs> but I don't want to. If you are willing and obedient, then you can eat the good of the land. So here's the problem. I think when you start talking about obedience, and you start talking about faithfulness and you start talking about loyalty to God and you start talking about loyalty to the word and you start talking about correcting past mistakes. I think the problem is, 
is that your flesh is going to immediately begin to resist that and not just resist that, but protest that in your life. Not just resist, but protest. We're seeing a lot of that in our nation these days. Not just resisting, but protesting everything that you don't, you know, you don't like. So your flesh will begin to, to resist and begin to protest. And here's the thing. Sometimes, we'll pe sometimes people will say to me things like this, okay? They'll say, well, you know what, Larry? I don't go to church because I don't want to be judged. And what they really mean is, I don't want to be presented with the truth that will make me uncomfortable or require me to change. And, and let me just say this. I am not qualified to be your judge. There is only one. And in the book of 2 Timothy, it says that one day the books will be opened and he, he, Jesus, will judge the living and the dead. He will either judge you after you're dead because you didn't, make the rap you didn't make it to rapture time or he'll judge you alive because you were alive when the rapture happened. But I am not your judge and I am not up here every Sunday to judge you or make you feel bad about yourself. That is not my role and that is not my job. There's only one judge and that's Jesus. That's not part of my job description. So all I'm trying to do is teach you simple obedience because that's the entry point to this miraculous life that I've been talking to you about for the last seven weeks. And it's life-changing stuff. It really is. It's life-changing stuff. Now I want to go on a little bit further. Can I go a little bit further? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to anyway. It's, it's, it's warm in here today. Whew. It's like the Super Bowl. No breeze. <laughs> Come on, you got to give me that one. Some of you are like, I don't even know what he's talking about, but that was awesome. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is one of those, uh, like, eat your vegetables messages, you know what I'm talking about? Like, sometimes it's, you know, dessert messages are good and meat messages are good, but this is one of those, uh, eat your fiber, get things going messages <clears throat> okay <clears throat> yeah I know okay here, here's why I say this here's why I say this we live in a day we live in a day where faithfulness is considered extremism And the lines are getting really blurry. And the scripture predicted that this would happen. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 says, You're going to find that there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching. But will fill up on spiritual junk food catchy opinions that tickle their fancy. They'll turn their backs on the truth and chase mirages. I almost read that meringue. I thought, hey. <laughs> but you, but you, keep your eye on what you're doing. Accept the hard times along with the good. Keep the message alive. Do a thorough job as God's servant. You should put your name in that verse and read it every day. Are we keeping the message alive? Are we keeping the message alive? 
Because if you think about your testimony, if you think about being a good example, if you think about following the teaching of scripture, we live in a time where that's considered extreme. Or we live in a time of hyper grace where we're pouring so much sugar on everything, we don't even know what's right or wrong. Let's go a little bit farther. As you live your life as a Christian, there are going to be times when, when Holy Spirit, who lives in you, will, will begin talking to you about making a correction in your life. And that can happen while you're reading scriptures. Um, that can happen while you're listening to teaching like, like you are today. That can happen as conviction. Just the still small voice of the Holy Spirit convicting you. You just don't feel right about something. And Holy Spirit is not doing that because he's bored. He's doing that because he loves you. And he knows that just like in the story of Jesus turning water into to wine. He knows that you can experience the miraculous when you take what Jesus says seriously. That's why the Holy Spirit is doing that. Now, I want, I want to close. I want to end with this. This is not a trick question, by the way. What is the opposite of obedience? Now, I know that, that you're thinking disobedience. But it's so much more than that. We, um, we had some really windy days earlier in the week. You remember those days, Sunday and Monday? And I think it was Monday night that I was, I was out walking our dog after dark. And, and the wind was blowing really hard that night. And, and it was blowing straight in my face. And we live on the top of a big hill. And so I was, I was struggling to get back up the hill because the wind was blowing so hard straight in my face. The wind was against me. And it made everything harder. Because the wind was against me. It was just, it was harder. I was more, I was more labored in my, in my breathing. I was more tired. I was more exhausted. It, it was just, it was just hard. It made everything harder. Going against the wind made everything harder. Now the word for wind in the Hebrew is the word ruash. And ruach also has another meaning as well. Ruach also means the spirit. So ruach means wind or the spirit. And this is so awesome because we see both of these together in one event in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit came as a rushing mighty wind. So the word for wind and the word for spirit are the same. The Holy Spirit is a holy wind. Now, what happens when you walk against the wind? It creates a drag. It becomes harder to move. You're worn down. You get tired easily. There's certainly nothing miraculous going on. And in the same way, when you walk against the Spirit... The wind of God, it creates a drag in your life. Everything you do becomes harder. Nothing that you do ever works out in the end. It takes more energy to do less. It's kind of like running with a parachute on. Because you're running, you're giving it all you got, you're giving it everything, you're, you're, you're wanting to get there as fast as you can, but you can't because there's drag behind you. There's drag on you. And here's the lesson. When you go against the Holy Spirit's correction in your life, you're not just being disobedient, you're walking against his wind. And anytime you're walking against the Spirit's wind, you're going to be weary and you're going to be worn down. Now, now stay with me just for another minute. 
what direction, if the Holy Spirit is wind and he, he is, then what direction does the Spirit blow? Well, he is a Holy Spirit, so he blows in the direction of that which is holy, and he blows against the direction of that which is unholy. Now, here's the awesome thing. If you're walking against the wind, what happens when you turn around? The same wind that was once against you is now giving you power. That's the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Again, the Holy Spirit is a he. He's not weird. So the same wind that was against you, is, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But it doesn't happen until you make a turnaround. So it is with the Spirit. If you will turn, if you will change course, if you will obey the Spirit's lead, then the drag will not only disappear, but the same wind that was against you will now begin to work to your advantage. Man, that, that, that's worth the offering, guys, right there. The wind will empower you and move you forward. And now everything that you do will become easier. Because you're not operating in drag. <laughs> that sounded bad. <laughs> I don't even know how to recover from that. You're not operating with a drag in your life. You're operating with a wind that's pushing you forward. Now, one more awesome thing, and then we're going to pray. Now that we understand this, let's read a verse that we don't always understand. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. Galatians 5 and verse 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. What that verse is saying is this. When you're walking with the wind at your back, pushing you forward, you're not going to, do, you're not going to be gratifying the desires of your flesh. But if you're walking against the Spirit's wind, and the wind is coming against you, then that's when you're going to be gratifying the desires of your flesh. Is, am I getting this right, Kevin? Okay. Okay. This all makes so much sense. Your life can go from being a drag to being a breeze when you do what Jesus says. So I'm going to ask this question and then we're going to pray. Is there a part of your life that is going against the Spirit's direction? You're like, well, I don't know. Well, if there's any part of your life that doesn't line up with Scripture, now you know. And I, again, I'm not here to judge you. I, 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 that's not my job. I, I, hey, I love you. I, I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to present truth to you. And that's what we're doing this morning. And if there is a part of your life that is going against the Spirit's direction, what you need to do is you need to turn it around and you need to start walking with the wind at your back instead of walking with the wind in your face. How do you correct a mistake? You stop making it. Let's all stand. All right. First things first, let's, let's pray. Lord, today, we are so grateful. We are so thankful. God, for your word, how that, how that it makes so much sense when we look at it with fresh eyes, not like the same old boring scriptures that we've heard all of our lives, maybe growing up in church, and we think, well, I already 
know all this, I already have all this figured out. No, no, no. Lord, when we, when we lose, when we stop being apathetic and we look at it with passion and we see it with fresh eyes, then all of a sudden things begin to make sense to us that did not make sense to us before. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful for John chapter 20 where John says Jesus did many other miraculous things but I have written these that those who would come later would believe. And so Lord, that's where we start today. We start with, do we believe? Do we believe? John said he wrote his gospel so that people would believe. And that's where we start this morning. And so we just pray for help today. In Jesus' name.